Welcome to the GAI discussion series. Uh, my name is Tad Lipsky. I'm an adjunct professor at Scalia Law School and the director of competition advocacy at the Global Antitrust Institute. And uh, very privileged to have with me today for this discussion, Terry Calvani, a very distinguished antitrust practitioner, uh, many uh, great professional credits uh, to his name, and I refer you to, uh, there's a pretty good Wikipedia page on him, and uh, he's been a commissioner of the Federal Trade Commission, a very distinguished uh, practitioner for uh, several firms, uh, most recently a major uh, global firm based in the UK, uh, and uh, his uh, experience is wide and deep, and uh, especially noteworthy given that our subject here is antitrust procedure and whether antitrust procedures are adequate to the task. He has some unique international experiences. Not only was he a member of the Federal Trade Commission, he was a member of the Irish Competition Authority, at which time he had some very significant roles in the relationships between the Irish Authority and the European Commission. Uh, and he has been an advisor to many foreign antitrust agencies and has consulted with and served as a non-governmental advisor to the International Competition Network and a variety of competition agencies around the world. And he's also experienced uh, as uh, representing parties in a variety of complex international antitrust matters. So he strikes me as the ideal person to raise the basic question, uh, how, are, how is the uh, antitrust world doing in terms of providing due process to the parties that are targeted by uh, antitrust uh, complaints and infringement allegations around the world. It's a subject that uh, uh, has perhaps not been uh, near as visible as the question of harmonization of substantive antitrust laws among the uh, numerous jurisdictions of the world that now have antitrust law. But I'd like to start by asking Terry his perspective on uh, due process at agencies, uh, antitrust agencies around the world, uh, what he thinks the problems and prospects might be. So Terry, please go ahead. Okay, well, th thank you for the invitation. Thank you for the very gracious introduction. I, I guess, um, you know, I could say absence of due process, but that, uh, that doesn't mean very much and due process means different things to different people. Uh, so maybe the best thing to do is sort of break it, break it out into its constituent parts. And I think one of the problems that we have uh, throughout the competition world, uh, greater problems in some places, lesser problems in other places, is um, an absence of transparency. Uh, and I guess the other would be uh, either the real existence of bias in the process or the perception uh, of bias in the process. And I'd like to you know, talk about both of those for a moment. Um, Let's take for, let's start with the transparency. I think litigants or respondents before any, any court or any administrative agency, anyone that undertakes adjudication ought to have, understand what the charges are against them and what the evidence is that will be considered in bringing in the case and its ultimate adjudication. Uh, and, and, and that means that the parties ought to be entitled to everything that the agency or the prosecutor has in their possession, whether it is uh, incriminating or whether it's exculpatory. They ought to have the whole ball of wax. Uh, and I, I, I just think that's fundamental uh, to having a transparent regime. Uh, and then secondly, uh, the party before um, the agency, uh, the, the court, uh, the prosecutor uh, ought to have the same powers or nearly the same powers as the government to secure evidence. That is, it, it ought to have the power to invoke compulsory process. Uh, and if the parties are armed with that, uh, that particular weapon, then they have the ability to go out and ferret information, ferret out information 
uh, that would be relevant to their case, but that they themselves don't actually possess and may solely be in the power in the possession of the government. So I think I, I'd start with that. Uh, and then uh, I would turn to um, a perception of, uh, of, of a bias. And I think that's that's incredibly important. And I said in a, a few moments ago, it's not only the existence of bias, but it's also a perception of bias. Mm -hmm. if, the, if, the, if the parties before the adjudicator perceive that the process is fundamentally unfair, then that calls into question the legitimacy of the exercise. So I think both bias and its perception of impartiality are, are very important to the process. Uh, one isn't isn't that much the perception isn't any less importance important than the reality. Um, and let me give you a couple of examples of that. Um, in uh, it hasn't been that long ago when uh, Commissioner Almunia, in the um, the credit Agricola case. Uh, uh, discuss the what the appropriate penalty would be in that case during the pendency of the investigation. And that brought about a, a, a subsequent investigation, independent investigation by the European Ombudsman, uh, where it would certainly appear, if you're thinking about what the sentence ought to be, that you've reached some decision before the conclusion of the investigation as to the liability of the party. Um, that's not a Europe, solely a European phenomenon. You go back in the United States in American antitrust history. And at one point, I recall the then chairman of the Federal Trade Commission, Michael Perchoff, talking about how important a win would be in the, 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 uh, the serials uh, shared monopoly case, uh, where you have the person who's going to adjudicate the case talking about how important a win would be, where where you see pretty dramatically where the function of, of the prosecutor, uh, the prosecutorial hat, uh, gets all mixed up with the, the role of the, of the party that's or the individual or the commission that's going to make the ultimate decision. So you've got two real examples which look like real bias in the process, one in Europe, one in the United States. Uh, but even leaving those aside, I think, uh, administrative processes where the functions of adjudication uh, and investigation are mixed pose some pretty severe uh, issues in terms of fundamental fairness and due process. Um, now, I don't, I don't think that that necessarily means that uh, administrative procedures where you have a, a single agency uh, are, are irredeemable or that they're per se uh, problematic. I mean, personally, uh, I'm indebted to the Anglo-American uh, process where uh, cases are brought, where the government stands in the shoes of a party plaintiff uh, before an independent magistrate. Uh, but but that's, that's our own culture. There are other cultures that do it a different way. And I think th th those countries, that, th those jurisdictions that do do it another way, that, Im that employ an administrative process, um, uh, uh, can ensure against uh, both issues of uh, the absence of transparency and a perception of bias by the way that they're organized. I mean, you have some... Uh, administrative agencies in the world where the the commission uh, is the adjudicator but some other independent group actually uh, does the investigation decides which cases to bring and then brings it to the commission which essentially acts as a tribunal um, and uh, I think that is would be a very important improvement in those uh, in those jurisdictions that employ an administrative model the FTC has moved sort of in that direction, where once a complaint has been brought, the commission, there's a wall between the commission and the staff that is acting as a prosecutor in the case, but that's not a complete fix. Uh, in my view, those function ought to be separated from the very beginning, the decision to initiate a case and the, de and the decision that ultimately results in the case. 
uh, it gets back to the the old uh, maxim of uh, 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 Sir Edward Cook that uh, no one ought to be the judge in their own case, and I, I think that's as valid today uh, as it was uh, when uh, Sir Edward uh, made those comments a long time ago. Um, but even assuming you have those safeguards in place, I guess the last element of a fix, if you will, is that there ought to be uh, robust, uh, meaningful judicial review. And um, uh, th that's a cure for lots of evils. So um, if, if you have real recourse to the courts, uh, where the courts have a, a power really to review the proceedings and not just intervene if there's something that appears terribly arbitrary or capricious some years later. I don't, I don't, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about real judicial review uh, within a reasonable period of time. And um, that is in some parts a, has been uh, uh, one of the things that I think uh, uh, saves the, the FTC uh, process. Uh, there are parties routinely uh, take uh, appeals from commission decisions, uh, and uh, and there's a, uh, you know the, the courts have been I think quite good in their reviews. I mean I um, uh, most of the opinions that I wrote uh, were appealed to courts. Maybe that's a reflection that the parties thought that the appeals were really poor. I don't know, but in any event. Uh, the courts reviewed it, and 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 uh, uh, one case that I remember vividly uh, was an important Robinson Patman case, where the uh, Circuit Court of the District of Columbia, the, the Court of Appeals, excuse me, uh, said, "Calvani, you got it wrong. I, that wasn't uh, wasn't my best day, uh, but I think that was an important part of the process." So um, I've been rambling on too long, but I guess to bring it back to go, I think that. Uh, uh, transparency, you know, understanding what the case is all about, having access to the evidence of the of the of the prosecutor, if you will, and also having the power to go out and develop your own evidence from third parties, where you can require the production of that evidence uh, as a part of the adjudication. I think that transparency is very important, and I think the the reality and the perception. Of of of, uh, of of an impartial decision maker is exceedingly important, uh, and uh, I think there's some ways to uh, in, better ensure that takes place in an administrative process without doing violence to the to the uh, uh, to the idea of an administrative agency uh, handling uh, these matters. I think there are processes that can be built in. Uh, that would better guarantee due process. And at the end of the story, I think there needs to be robust uh, judicial um, uh, review. Uh, I mentioned Almunia's uh, 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 dis discussion or statement about, or thinking about the penalty at the time that the case was still uh, subjudicate under consideration. Um, I read in the papers, I guess it was in the last 10 days, a story about uh, a commissioner in a competition agency uh, talking about how the respondents uh, were uh, hadn't learned their lesson the first time through, uh, and uh, in the context of a yet another proceeding, where you wondered, well, uh, has the has the decision maker already made up their mind? I have no idea whether that story is any merit to it or whether the quotations were accurate. But that's the sort of thing I've been talking about. Let me pause, and you probably have some questions that would better flesh out the, these issues than me rambling. Well, it's not rambling, Terry. I mean, uh, you've uh, written a bunch of articles on the subject and we can get to some of those in a moment, but uh, it's obvious that you're afflicted with a whole series of coherent thoughts on this issue. So you may regard it as rambling, but it sounds very, uh, very logical and, and cogent to me. Uh, I'd like to to just pause for a second on the, the, uh, the, the element of the neutral decision maker. And I wonder if I could get you to comment on something that has struck me as I've practiced before various agencies uh, around the world. 
Uh, it is true that many, uh, I mean, aside from administrative litigation at the FTC, generally the dominant model for uh, government enforcement is some kind of administrative agency uh, with some variety of judicial review. But um, in most cases, there, there, uh, the enforcement agency will be a, a group, maybe three, five, seven, or nine uh, commissioners, let's call them. Uh, and uh, ultimately the decisions come up to them through a bureaucracy that has some structure or another. But, but my point is that, the, that usually the initial decision maker in those administrative agency processes, if it's not a, a lower level bureaucrat like uh, used to be, I don't know if it's still the same that the uh, French agency, but it used to be you'd have a rapporteur who would uh, make a recommendation based on his review of the evidence. He'd present it to the Conseil de la Concurrence and then it would go elsewhere from there. But the parties and particularly the target of the allegation, whether you call him a defendant or a respondent or something else, would have the opportunity to present his case in some form or another uh, directly to the individuals who comprise this agency. So maybe you could, uh, you, you'd have five members of the Conseil and they would vote uh, to say, you, you know, you're liable for an infringement or you're not liable for an infringement. But at some point you would have the opportunity to submit papers directly to those individuals and to have the opportunity for oral presentation to those individuals. But the European Commission, it strikes me, uh, has some unique departures from that. Ma the main one being that under the structure as has been practiced for some time now with a lot of variation, of course, uh, number one, the decision-making body is the full College of Commissioners. And uh, as I understand the articles of the treaty, every uh, determination of infringement and every remedy and every uh, undertaking accepted in, uh, as a consent resolution of a commission statement of objections has to be approved by the College of Commissioners. And it's true that there is a, an enormous degree of delegation down through the structure, either to the competition commissioner, who I imagine the, the commissioner's recommendation is almost always followed by, by the college. And then, of course, I'm sure that the commissioner is, uh, has a very close relationship, day-to-day -day relationship with the director general of DG Comp and then so on and so forth down to the other director, the directors of the particular offices and so forth. But what struck me is at no point does the target of an SO have an actual right to present views either written or oral to the members of the college or to the actual decision maker. And in fact, uh, the hearing is conducted by somebody who is really there to assure that access to the file has been granted and that the procedural rights of the parties have been respected. But the, the so-called hearing officer, as I understand it, does not and never has had any substantive decision-making authority. So it's a little odd because when you go before an ALJ at the FTC, for example, in a part three hearing, you're talking to somebody who is going to write who is going to comprise the record and write an initial decision based on what has occurred in his or her physical presence, essentially, or, well, not always physical, but at least the case has been presented directly to the ALJ. But I don't understand that either the commissioner nor the director general of DG Comp ever attends the so-called oral hearing uh, in a DG Comp matter. So, you can submit papers to the various members of the DG Comp staff or perhaps to members of the legal service or individuals who play various roles in different parts of this uh, tremendous EC bureaucracy, but at no time can you offer sort of a, an organized, coherent, written and or 
oral presentation to the college. So uh, do you have any reaction to that? I, I, I know you have a tremendous amount of experience, far more than I do at, at the commission. And so uh, I'd be uh, interested in your perspective on those unique features uh, uh, as among the administrative uh, agencies that do enforce antitrust law, those, those unique aspects of the European Commission? Well, I'm not, I'm not sure they're unique. Um, um, you have a whole spectrum of, of uh, jurisdictions that employ an administrative model, and, and some are much more alike, and some of them are different, and, and they, they, there's kind of a range there. Um, I, I, think, I, I think what is necessary, I mean, what, whether or not you're treated fairly, I mean, your, your question uh, suggests uh, that at least some people, including yourself, uh, see this as, uh, as uh, evidence of, uh, of, of other than a neutral decision maker. And I, I think that's the important factor. Uh, if the process is not perceived to be fair, uh, then the agency has an institutional problem in the sense that it loses legitimacy. And uh, police agencies, prosecutors, courts, all organs of government need legitimacy, uh, the, the, the belief by the Commonwealth that they're legitimate institutions and that they they carry out their function in a just way. So um, I think the cure uh, to that is a separation of the prosecutorial function from the adjudicary, adjudicatory, adjudication function, excuse me, up really early this morning and my, my uh, uh, seemingly, seemingly unable to pronounce words. But at any rate, uh, uh, I, think that's, I think that's what's crucial. And uh, there are administrative agencies that do make that separation. I mean, the FTC does not. I mean, it's got some, it's got some um, safeguards built into it. Uh, the ALJ, which used to be called a trial examiner, which is really kind of a special master in the employee of the commission, went out and tr tried to develop the facts. Uh, now it's in a much more court-like setting, but the function is, is really not that different than it was. Uh, and I think that, that that same problem exists there. You, the, the people that make the decision to bring the case and decide the case at the FTC are the very same people. And that's the same problem that exists, in my view, in the European Commission and a whole lot of other agencies. Now, some administrative agencies, uh, some jurisdictions have, have, have managed to retain an administrative model and build in a greater degree of, uh, of, of, of fairness, if you will, by separating those functions. Now, to be sure, the commission has, uh, has safeguards uh, 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 that supposedly uh, uh, guard against that. The people that internally not associated with the case, whether they be the legal service or another group that that uh, review the the uh, the facts in light of the law to ensure that it's consistent. I don't think that's enough. I think they need to be separate for the very reasons that you just put out, uh, that you just articulated. And that is that there's a perception that something's not right here. Uh, and sometimes I think that perception is grounded in reality, uh, as with Commissioner Almunia uh, and his statements in the uh, uh, the Credit Agricola case uh, and uh, Commissioner Chairman Perchok at the FTC and his observations about the serials litigation. We were talking about what we, what kind of penalty we ought to impose, or the or assuming that guilt is to be found uh, before you uh, before you've reached, or supposedly before you've reached a decision. But then, those are kind of outliers. The bigger problem is is the simple perception that it does, that it's not fair. And I think that can be cured by separation of those functions. Now, you still have some perception problem. And that is, uh, even if you separated them, there was a time, for example, at the FTC, where all, all uh, trial examiners and later ALJs were, were alumni of the institution. Their offices were in the same building. Um, and 
you had this process built in, but everybody uh, went to the the same church, uh, and and uh, that didn't that didn't uh, eradicate the perception of unfairness. Uh, so I think they need to be separated, uh, and um, and there ought to be robust judicial review. Uh, and we've seen some. We've uh, there've been a couple of decisions of late at the commission where where the court has. Uh, uh, has pointed out defects, and 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 may, maybe we'll see some uh, uh, some movement there. And there are other jurisdictions that have the same problem, and we have to look at the United States. In my view, we have that same problem with the FTC. All right. Well, let's uh, let's uh, take as a point of departure for for a moment that. Uh, we're able to persuade uh, some significant uh, subset of the antitrust community of the validity of what you've just uh, very clearly articulated. Uh, often, if not characteristically these days, when we want to encourage adherence to a standard or a best practice or uh, get some some idea of how antitrust enforcement should be conducted, popularized or socialized within the international enforcement agency community, we would go e to either or both. Uh, the OECD Competition Committee uh, has a very uh, long and distinguished uh, record as a as a forum for discussion, development of common views. Uh, among antitrust agencies of different jurisdictions, or of course the much younger but with broader membership ICN. Uh, you know, the ICN kind of started with recommended practices about merger notification and review and has gone on to a, a number of other subjects, including in certain ways uh, procedural uh, aspects of antitrust enforcement. What do you think the prospects are that the OECD and the ICN offer uh, or would offer uh, the best avenue for implementing some kind of best practice having to do with separation of uh, prosecution and adjudication. That's not going to happen. I mean, uh, <laughs> that's uh, uh, we could make we could make a fantasy movie about that. That's not going to happen. Uh, Roberto Michel had his iron law of oligarchy, Calvani has his iron law of bureaucracy, and that is bureaucracies never willingly uh, uh, divest themselves of power. And I think it is um, beyond imagination that you could expect uh, agencies to decide that uh, because of the danger of them reaching the wrong results or because of the perception that they're not doing a good job, they ought to, uh, they ought to divest power. Uh, th that's not that's simply not going to happen and, and part and it's not that that uh, you know, anybody's got uh, uh, um, malevolent ideas I think uh, when I was at the FTC uh, I was pretty sure that the decisions that I made about who to prosecute and who to not were right uh, and I was pretty sure that the decisions I made in terms of ultimate liability were right um, and uh, I, I thought it was a pretty dispassionate person. Um, th there's something wrong with that picture. None of us uh, are particularly adept at saying, uh, you know, I, I made a, a big mistake there. I, I wasted a ton of the taxpayers' dollars on a case that ought never been investigated nor brought. Uh, and then I also wasted millions of dollars on the part of the respondent uh, because of this mistake I made. Um, and it's not, it, it's not because we willingly want to make mistakes or that we ever perceive that we have. Uh, I tried to do the very best job I could in analyzing the law and the facts. And I'm sure that that's what takes place in uh, almost every agency that has that kind of a model. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think you can expect to see uh, the heads of agencies and senior people in these agencies, and indeed uh, the worker bees saying this, this, this nothing, it's not broke. There's no need to fix it. We're, we're doing a, a very good job. And, um, you know, I think it's, th that argument is a very hard argument to, to make and win. If there's going to be change, 
it's not going to come from organizations that by and large, not completely, but by and large are composed of people, men and women, uh, that uh, are making every effort to do a great job in their agencies, to bring the cases that ought to be brought and, uh, and to uh, make the right decisions. Um, that's not the right place to go. And that's a reason why I think that uh, uh, there's been no movement here. They're talking to the wrong people. And it's not because they, uh, the, the members of the ICN or the OECD or Terry Calvani when he was at the FTC or when he was at the Irish Competition Agency are trying to, uh, to do something they ought not. They're trying to do a good job. But that's not, that's not, <laughs> that's not the impartial uh, forum where you want to make that argument. What you need well, to do is you need to get interest groups that think there's something wrong and you need to address those concerns to uh, the people that make those, uh, make those laws that, uh, uh, that create those institutions in that way and change has got to come from that direction. Uh, bureaucracies never willingly divest themselves of power. Well, uh, let me just make one more comment. And uh, depending on your reaction, uh, we've been going at it for a while, so we can draw to a close. But let me invite you to comment on the following. Uh, you know, I discovered when I became interested in this topic, which is a while ago now, actually, that uh, there have been some fairly trenchant criticisms of, the, uh, of these procedural defects in antitrust enforcement, both with respect to the FTC and with respect to the European Commission. As an example, uh, you had a, uh, I believe a 1989 article that went into some of this, uh, which I believe was focused on the FTC itself. And uh, I also noticed that uh, no less a figure than uh, Ian Forrester, who is a very distinguished uh, and successful practitioner uh, at the Scots Bar before being appointed as a judge of the general court. Of course, uh, as a member from the UK, Brexit, I think, has diverted his career away from Luxembourg. But uh, there are others, uh, John Temple Lang, who, who had a distinguished uh, uh, career and uh, part, part of his career in the commission and part of it actually as the hearing officer. Uh, they've both written uh, uh, very, uh, I, I guess I should say, uh, uh, very politely worded but trenchant criticisms of some of the aspects of procedure that we've been talking about. Uh, to no <laughs> or little visible effect. And I gather you would regard that as simply a confirmation of your uh, assessment that uh, it, it really is going to take more than, than the antitrust lawyers and agency talk, talking to each other to uh, produce significant movement on some of these issues. Well, yes and no. I mean, um... Uh, do I think that conversations like this are a waste? No, I think they're valuable. I think it's important to keep this this issue and other other important issues uh, front and center, and to continue to talk about them. Uh, and I think over time uh, you build support. I mean, um, I, I think I think that's been true of this issue. Um, and so I think they're important. They're they're valuable contributions to the community at large. Uh, and specifically to the competition law community. But that's, that's not sufficient uh, to bring about uh, meaningful change, uh, in, at least in this area, for the reason that uh, this, this Calvani's iron law bureaucracy. Uh, that, that's, I don't, that's, not, that's not enough. And so if, you, if, you, if you're going to carry forward with the battle, uh, you need to change the venue. And... Um, uh, um, I mean, one of the problems that um, that that those of us uh, like yourself, uh, formerly at Latham and and uh, and, and 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 me at, at, at Freshfields, 
widely perceived as people who carry briefs for respondents in these proceedings. And uh, as, the, as, the, as the bureaucrats may be biased, well, of course, uh, Galvani is going to be biased. He's representing people and he's, he's uh, here in, uh, in Brussels on behalf of some client. Uh, so I think that discussion is important, but the, 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 the audience that needs to be convinced is, uh, is not the agencies themselves uh, or more people that have a, uh, who are you know, direct stakeholders who, who make their living uh, representing people who appear before the, uh, the commission. Uh, I, I think it has to, it, there needs to be a broader audience. And, and frankly, I think sometimes that we focused on the, the wrong fora. Uh, and um, and if we're going to get uh, movement here, but you know, if you look at, if if you look around the world, there've been eight, there've been jurisdictions that have have separated these functions, um, where the the uh, tribunal, the the commission, uh, or the or the uh, uh, the commission uh, uh, is is separate uh, from the prosecutorial function. Some other group of people decide what to investigate and, and then they bring that uh, uh, to an adjudicated body. And there's some, uh, some agencies that have just moved to that model. Uh, so I don't think it's tilting at windmills. Uh, there's been movement that way. And, you know, I, I, somebody ought to take a look and see, okay, how, how, what is the nature of that movement? How many jurisdictions have, have moved that direction and why? And, and how did it come about? Um, so those would all be important things to put on someone's uh, tick list. Excellent. Well, Terry, unless you have anything further you'd like to add. Um, I well, that's a bad question to ask me. I can, I can go on for, for all day and uh, put the audience to a very deep sleep, uh, but that's probably not a good idea. Well, in any event, uh, the antitrust community is very grateful uh, for your services over many years and for reasons known only to you and perhaps uh, a deity. Uh, we're delighted that you continue to supply your accumulated wisdom, which gets greater with, uh, with passing time. And the GAI specifically is very grateful that you are willing to participate in this discussion series. Uh, Thank you very much, and uh, we'll leave it there. Delighted to be here. Thank you very much, Dad.